Hey y'all, Coach Unify here, talking about Shemini Adzeret and how it is actually a Sabbath day. Now, with all this going on, this eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles that they call Shemini Adzeret, I believe is how it's pronounced, is actually already a significant day. But when you think about how it is actually a Sabbath day, adds even more significance to that day. So this is going to turn out to be a very important class for a lot of people because in this class, not only am I going to show you how it is a Sabbath day, but I'm going to go in and show you what that means and what the significance of the Sabbath day is and um, how by keeping this Sabbath day is uh, going to you know change a lot of people's lives talking about those people who haven't yet started keeping a Sabbath day um, is, is this is going to be a really interesting class so uh, you may have to pull out your pencil we're going to talk about a lot of different verses I'm going to run through these pretty quickly you may even have to go in and watch this video twice to gain all of the information that we're going to talk about in this video all right so first thing we want to do is look over at Leviticus chapter 23 in verse 39 and show you how it says that the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles or Shemini Adzeret is actually a Sabbath day. You see that written right there at the end of the verse when it says, uh, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days and on the first day shall be a Sabbath and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Now, this is one of the ways we understand how it is that we are to calculate the Sabbath days. Um, it's talking about this first day, which fell on the 15th day of the month and the eighth day, which fell on the 22nd day of the month. And if you go back to the feast of the memorial of blowing of trumpets, which was the first day of the uh, sacred month, it was also a Sabbath day. And that's pretty much how it works um, every single month. Um, you have the new moon, which would fall on the first day of the month. And then you start counting seven days after that. So each month, uh, according to the lunar cycle, you would have the first, the eighth, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th days of each month would be the sacred Sabbath day. Now, I do recognize that there is a lot of controversy. There's a lot of debate going on on when the actual Lord's Sabbath uh, falls. Um, and we've done plenty of classes showing you how to determine the Lord's Sabbath. But we've also done classes uh, explaining that it is important to have a Sabbath day. Uh, there's still some people who are actually work in jobs where they don't have a lot of autonomy in order to uh, pick the day that they want off. So they have to go have their day off according to when the boss says they get their day off. But they too can still meet the requirement um, because, you know, until you actually start learning how to do the calculation according to Leviticus 23, it's almost, you know, no times in the scripture that tells you that you are or tells you when the Sabbath day is actually supposed to be. It simply states that you work seven days or you work six days and you take the seventh day as a Sabbath day. So if you, you know, are off on Tuesdays, if you get off on every Friday or whatever, you can keep that as your Sabbath day um, and still meet the requirement is my point. But um, there is a benefit to actually trying to get the Sabbath day correct. You can see that over here in Ex uh, Ezekiel chapter 46 when it's talking about the temple. Now, of course, um, we are building the third temple on our hearts today. That third temple is a spiritual temple being built on the hearts or the conscious of humanity. But it, too, will have a similar structure as the other temples, the heavenly temple and the earthly temple. It'll have a courtyard. And that's what's talked about over here in Ezekiel chapter uh, 46 and verse one. Let me read it. It says, thus saith the Lord, the gate of the inner court 
that looketh toward the east shall be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. So this is significant. You know, when we're thinking about our uh, heavenly or our spiritual temple, that temple that is inside of us, it is actually on the Sabbath day where the courtyard is open. You know, so, you know, we can expect some um, communication that we may not receive on the other days when the courtyard is closed. Um, that should remind you of how the Messiah, when he was walking around, you know, many of his if not all of his miracles were performed on the Sabbath day. That's why he got in so much trouble because, you know, he healed people on the Sabbath day um, and did a lot of other stuff like, you know, talking, like teaching down at the um, temple on the Sabbath day. Um, so you can expect that kind of thing to be going on now just in a spiritual nature. You know, is the father still healing on the Sabbath day? Is he still um, um, um teaching on the Sabbath day. Well, that's one reason why we would want to get the Sabbath day correct so we can receive that healing. We can receive those lessons that are coming on that specific day. But whether or not we're receiving those uh, blessings or not, we need to get back to the basics and realize that keeping the Sabbath day is actually a commandment. You see that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Um, in fact, there's a lot of verses that talk about uh, this commandment is actually one of the uh, longest written commandments that you read about in Exodus chapter 20. It says, uh, verse 8 simply says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But verse 9, verse 10 and 11 goes into detail on what it is that we're supposed to be doing on that day. And you'll, you'll, you'll find these details in many places of the Bible it covers it in a lot of places um, telling us what it is that we're supposed to do on the Sabbath day and like we said we've done plenty of classes on it um, and on the Sabbath day and we've included those rules even from the book of Jubilees uh, I think it's chapter 49 or chapter 50 I believe it's chapter 50 that goes into probably the most detail on what it is that we're supposed to do on the Sabbath day. Let me show you that just for I'm not going to go over it, but I'll just show you what I'm talking about here. Yeah, you see right there at the beginning, it's talking about um, the laws regarding the Jubilees, but it also has the laws regarding the Sabbath day it starts down here. Verse six. Um, uh and we have a link to this book in the description of this video. If you guys want to go in and look at um, some of the details on what it is we can do and what it is that we can't do on the Sabbath day. Go ahead and check those out. Um, we're going to uh, go on here and look at what else we have to cover. The next thing that we have to cover is going to be about how the Sabbath day is actually a sign between us and our father. Like I said, we're going to get into the some of the details on how important the Sabbath day is. Um, this is only one place over here in Exodus chapter 31 and 13, where it's talking about how it's actually a sign. Let me read it. It says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doeth sanctify you. Okay, now there's a lot going on in this verse. Let's, let's break down a few of these points here. The first one is see how it's talking about the children of Israel. Now, there's there's a lot of people that, you know, want to misunderstand what's going on here. Um, the word Israel is actually a spiritual name. The word Jacob, if you some for you guys who are not really familiar with the story, you hear people talk about Jacob. Jacob and Israel were the same individual. Um, his name, he was born with the name Jacob, but when he, um, decided, uh, that he was going to allow our heavenly father to become his God, um, there was a lot of things that transpired there, but 
his name was actually changed to Israel. So, you know, when people say that um, when the Bible is talking about Israel, he's talking about a race of people. No, um, when it's talking about Jacob, it's talking about a, ra a race of people. That's what you hear Jacob's trouble. Um, for those who know who Jacob is, if you don't really know who Jacob is, you can look over there in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, verse 68, I believe is one of the places, I believe it's maybe the whole chapter 28, who will explain to you who Jacob is. But when you're thinking about Israel, it's talking about a spiritual group of people. That's why it ends in the word E-L. It's talking about something spiritual. And to be spiritual Israel means that you are obeying the commandments and doing what the scripture says. Like you read over there in the book of Esther, I believe it is. It is possible to become Israel, even though you're not born Israel. You can convert over to become Israel simply by keeping the commandments, you know, simply by keeping the Sabbath day, which is, you know, we're going to find out here shortly. Once a person starts keeping the Sabbath day and keeping the commandments, they actually become come who the scripture is talking about and so anytime you see the word um children of israel you'll know that he's actually talking about you no matter what race you are you know he's talking about you um those people who are obeying and doing what he's talking about when he's saying speaking to the children of israel you you know he's talking to you if you are obeying what he's saying if you are ignoring uh, what he's saying when he says speak unto the children of Israel, then you ain't Israel. But if you are obeying it, then you are Israel. I guess I should have said that, you know, this probably the most simple way I could have actually said it. But anyway, it says, verily my Sabbath ye shall keep for it is a sign between me and you. Now, we see this in several places. We're going we're gonna to jump to a couple other places. Um where we see this word sign used. He says a sign between me and you. And you see, you know, there's people who are looking for the mark of the beast. Well, the word sign is another way of saying mark. Those words are synonymous. Mark and sign are the same. So this is, this, that's why you hear some people talk about how, you know, if you keep the Sabbath day on the wrong day, you have the mark of the beast. There's actually a book written. I got it on the shelf up there somewhere called Sunday. Sunday law where there's some people who are trying to explain that if you um, keep the Sunday law or something like that, you may have the mark of the beast. Well, where they're getting that from is that the Sabbath day is a mark. It's the mark. It's a mark that's on us. And so they're they're suggesting that if you keep it on the wrong day, that you have the mark of the beast. And I would argue that, you know, in light of all of the scripture that I've read, um, I say again, that is important that you keep a Sabbath day and, you know, to, you know, support what they're saying, I would say. It's the person who doesn't keep a Sabbath day that actually has the mark. Not if they're keeping it on the wrong day, but if they're not keeping that day a Sabbath day at all, they're the ones who have the mark of the beast or whatever. But that's a lot of conjecture in there. So we'll just go on. Notice right there, it says um, throughout your generations, you know, we're never supposed to stop keeping the Sabbath day. This is, you know, like the Messiah said over there in Matthew chapter four. Uh, five, I believe it is, um, where he said that he didn't come to do away with the law. Let me jump over there and look at that right quick. Um, it's Matthew chapter five, verse 17 and 18, when he said, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets, um, have come not to destroy, but to fulfill when, of course, fulfill being the opposite of destroy. Um, he didn't come to do away with these laws. He came to establish these laws even more so than Moses did. And, you know, that's what he did. You know, he went on and uh, he kept all of the laws th that you read about over there at Exodus chapter 24, um, uh, verse, chapter 23. 20 through 24 verse 7 and not only did he keep them but he actually taught them to his disciples and expected everybody else to keep them as well 
and you know that's what he's talking about when he says you know we will keep um, or this will be a sign throughout our generation and we're going to see in this class how it is a significant sign that you know between him and I it, it even hints about it a little bit here when he says that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you implying that if you do not keep the Sabbath day then you do not know that he is the Lord that does sanctify you well that's the way I understand that and then when you jump down here to um, uh, verse 17 of the same chapter, it says it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So, again, we hear about it actually being a sign forever. It's never supposed to go away. Um, let's see. The next chapter we'll go to is chapter 16. And verse four, it says, then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, for the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, we really get into some really important stuff here. Um, and this is kind of why we do these classes, because, you know, if you've read the book of Exodus, you may have skipped over uh, this verse here, not understanding what it's saying there. It's first of all talking about the manna that was given to the children right after they left um, Egypt there. You see, we're in chapter 16, so they haven't even gotten the uh, book of the covenant yet. That doesn't come until um uh, Mount Horb over there in chapter 20. But even here, he's talking about the Sabbath day and how it is that they were only supposed to gather manna for six days. And on the seventh day, they weren't supposed to gather any manna. But what you should understand or gather out of this verse is right there at the end where he says that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Like I said, this is important stuff for somebody out there who is it who's learning now and during this class that they're supposed to be keeping the Sabbath day. Let this sink in that what is telling us here and I'm living proof of it is that if you do not learn to keep the Sabbath day, you will not be able to keep the other rules you will not see where it says walk in my law you will not be able to keep the rest of the law this is why so many people have trouble uh, with the law you hear them say you know nobody can keep the law well you know if you learn to keep the sabbath day that will go a long way into your learning you know it, of course you you know you learn you, you grow as you read the scripture or whatever and you get better you know as you go but you really need to start off keeping a sabbath day because if you don't keep the sabbath day According to what we read here in verse four, if you don't keep the Sabbath day, you're not going to be able to keep the rest of those laws. You know, you're not going to you're not going to be able to do it. Um, it's, it's going you're going to be wasting your time trying to keep the statutes, trying to keep the commandments, trying to keep the judgments um, that you read about from Exodus chapter 20 through 24. You, if you can't keep this one here. Talking about the Sabbath day, you're not going to be able to keep the rest of those rules. All right, so let's look over in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, and see what it says. It says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. It's saying that it is necessary to keep the Sabbath day that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Um, let's look at another place. I hope you see the pattern of what it's talking about here. You see right here in Ezekiel 20 and 20, it says, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Now, we're seeing this over and over. Um... It's kind of combining them here with the statutes. Uh, the Sabbath day is a statute and is saying that we have to keep the Sabbath day and the statute in order to know that he is the Lord, our God. So one could use this and they will 
use this to make an argument that anybody who is not keeping the Sabbath day or anybody who is not keeping the statutes doesn't know who God is. Uh, and I mean, you can see this pretty evidently when you look at how they have formed a religion instead of, you know, going by what the scripture says and obeying the scripture verbatim and doing what the commandments tell them to do. They've actually formed their own religion in order to appease their spirit, in order to make them feel like they are doing something in order to make them seem like they are, you know, uh, feeding their spirit or whatever. They've created a religion. They've made it all about a religion. Without minding the Sabbath day, your relationship with the Most High God, um, our Father and Creator, is is suspect, really, because you know we've read in and you know so far, and we got some other verses to talk about how keeping the Sabbath day is necessary. So anybody that's, you know, trying to preach to us, trying to teach to us and they ain't keeping the Sabbath day, you know, you know what they're teaching is actually suspect. But anyway, let's jump over here and let's look at Jasher. Like I said, I wanted to cover a lot of stuff. I'm going to bring you over to the book of Jasher here. Um, and I'm going to give you a reference to this book here in a second. Um, because people looking in their Bibles and they're like, uh, I don't know where Jasher is at. Well, let's look at it and see what it says right here. Uh, verse 44 says, And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Let there be given unto the servants, the children of Israel, who are in Goshen, one day to rest therein from their labors. Now, what's going on here is this is Moses having a conference, having a communication with Pharaoh before the children of Israel were allowed to leave Egypt. This is um, before Exodus chapter 16 that we was reading about where he was giving them the manna out there in the um, wilderness over here. They're still in Egypt and they're still crying out to the Lord for help. And Moses is there, you know, giving the whole, you know, let my people go speech. Well, one of the things that he did, even before the plagues came down, was Moses went to Pharaoh and asked them, would he allow the children of Israel to have a day off? Right there, one day of rest therein from their labor. Um, you remember how they were, you know, they were um, making them do the bricks and they were putting hard labor on them. Well, here it is, Fabro saying, you know, well, can they have at least one day off? And we see in verse 46, and Pharaoh ordered the proclamation to be issued throughout Egypt and Goshen, saying to you, all the children of Israel, thus says the king, for six days ye shall do your work and labor, but on the seventh day ye shall rest and shall not perform any work. Thus shall ye do all the days as the king and Moses, the son of Bethia, has commanded. There it is, a Sabbath day. You have Moses getting a Sabbath day. And you read right there in verse 49 that this was actually the Lord's work. This is our father's hand here working with the children of Israel even before they had been released from Egypt. That's so why I said at the beginning of this video, this is some very important stuff because some of the people, you know, maybe yourself included, are just now starting to pay attention to these spiritual things and these biblical things because, you know, of some videos that they saw on our channel. And, you know, we get testimonies all the time. You know, people, you know, talk about how they haven't read their Bibles in years. Um, you know, so if they ain't reading their Bibles, of course, they're not doing what it says. So they're not keeping up with, you know, what they should be keeping up with. Uh, and, but, and you can, the thing about it, they're still in Egypt. You know, this is modern day Egypt. That's why we see all these Egyptian symbols all over our money and everywhere. This is a modern day Egypt. You know, we've, we've done classes on this to, to explain this, how, you know, America and the other civilized nations are the modern day Egypt. Just remember, just if, if, you know, we can read in Exodus and Genesis, read in Genesis primarily, you could just understand that, that Egypt was the first country the first time ever when the children of Israel went into Egypt that was the first time ever that anybody on the planet had to 
purchase food to eat. Before then, nobody had purchased food ever on the earth. People always grew their food. It was because of Joseph storing up that corn that, you know, that was the first time corn was actually sold. Um, and even to this day, humans are the only species of animal that has to pay to eat. That's what it means by modern day Egypt is that we have to pay to actually eat food. No, no other species on the planet has to pay a penny in order to eat. Well, they also invented prisons in Egypt. You remember Joseph was in a prison that no prisons were ever talked about before in scripture. You know, pr prisons are not even biblical. You know, if you did something wrong, according to the Bible, you was either fined, you was uh, beat or whipped or you was killed. You know, you, you wasn't put in a prison um, for long periods of time um, that was invented in Egypt. And, you know, a lot of the medicines and stuff was invented in Egypt and all of this stuff is still going on. The schools were invented in Egypt, you know, um, and some other things that I can't think of now. A lot of the, the, the modern things that we consider part of our civilization was actually born or created or started in Egypt. And that's why, you know, we're considered now the modern day Egypt. We're saying over here in the book of Jasher that... Uh, before the children of Israel was ever allowed to leave Egypt, uh, they was keeping the Sabbath day. And that's important because, you know, we're thinking of exiting Egypt even now and in our times now. So, you know, keeping the Sabbath day will be necessary. That was a living parable for us back then for us to understand. Well, the same thing is going to go on now. There's some people, like I said, listening to this video who are in a modern day Egypt. And they're, they're looking for their escape. Well, if you ever want to get out of this beast type system that we live in, it is necessary, absolutely necessary that you keep the Sabbath day. I'm trying to drill that in, you know, to you guys to, to keep the Sabbath day. But, you know, some, some of the guys like, what, what is this book called Jasher? And I said I was going to show you a reference to it. When you look over in one of the places that you can see a reference to the book called Jasher is over in the book called Joshua in chapter 10. Um, let me read verse 13. It says, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about the whole day. Yeah, this is the sun stopping here. You know, he, the, our Father in heaven stopped the sun from moving across the sky or stopped so that Jasher could actually win this war. And, you know, that, that's, I'm sitting there smiling because I'm thinking of all of the people listening to this verse right here. You got the flat earthers who says that the, the sun is moving and not the earth is moving. Well, according to this verse here, it said the sun stood still. It didn't say the earth stood still. The earth stopped spinning. It said the sun stood still. But, um, Anyway, this actually references that book of Jasher that we was talking about. And, you know, all we have to do is search for the word sun and we'll actually find it here. Watch. Looks like up. Looks like it's up here in uh, Jasher chapter 88 and verse 63, where it's talking about how Joshua pre pretty much commanded that the sun stand still. And, you know, this is why the. Constantine and those guys back there, um, the Catholic people who canonized the Bible. This is why they left out a lot of the books because, you know, they had supernatural stuff and it was a little bit unbelievable. It's like, uh, these guys commanded the sun to stop moving across the sky and it did. And they said, you know, this stuff is kind of unbelievable. Maybe we shouldn't include this in the Bible and they left these books out, you know. Well, <laughs> Who they got? Who are them guys to choose, you know, the power that our father has? If he want to stop the sun, he can stop the sun anytime he wanted to. They should have left these books in here. This is vital information, you know, that we need, you know, even even in today's time. But um, let's go on with this class. The next verses that we want to talk about are over in Isaiah and chapter 58, uh, verses 13 and 14. Um, I didn't plan on talking about uh, verse 12, but notice what it's talking about there when it's talking about the repairs of the breach and the restorers of paths to dwell in. 
Um, that's kind of our theme over here on our channel. This is what we're doing. This is why we spend so much time trying to uh, teach you guys about the, uh, the the covenant, the book of Exodus through uh, chapter 20 through chapter 24, verse 7. We spend a lot of time, you know, trying to tell you guys about, you know, the the Sabbath day and other things. We, we focus on it because we're trying to close some of this gap, close this, re this relationship gap between us and our father. We're trying to uh, close the bridge. Reach. We're trying to restore the paths to dwell in and we understand these paths go through Leviticus 23 It is necessary to keep those feast days over there in Leviticus 23 if we ever want to get back in 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 the graces of our father I mean that's how you know the children of Belial is when they keep the feasts of Belial, those pagan holidays. Well, it is necessary to keep the feasts of the Lord if we want to be the children of the Lord. And it should, you know, be easy to put them together like two and two. But anyway, let's look at verse 13 as it's talking about the Sabbath day. It says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Now, this it applies to everybody, not only the new guys who, you know, Today or this week or, you know, will be the first time they will ever keep a Sabbath day. But this applies to the people who have been keeping a Sabbath day for years. Me, myself, you know, back when I read the um, entire Bible back there in about 1998, um, I started keeping the Sabbath day. But, you know, it was... It, I wasn't doing 13. I, what's what it's talking about in verse 13. I wasn't making it a pleasurable experience. I wasn't taking delight in it. That didn't actually occur until the year about 2018. So I, I was keeping the Sabbath day in a humdrum kind of manner for 20 years but then after that when I started when I read this verse right here and I started trying to keep the Sabbath day according to this manner right here you can look at verse 14 and see what actually happened uh, in my life it was a significant change um, this whole chapter um, is life changing if you grasp what it's talking about when it comes to fasting and you know uh, uh, how you do atonement day or whatever um, Anyway, you read verse 14, it says, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So, you know, you have, you know, a lot of blessings that are talking about here once we do the Sabbath day correctly. And, you know, of course, we want these blessings here. Um, one of the things about the Sabbath day is it's a time of healing. It's a spot time of spiritual renewal. It's, you know, it's a really important time. It's probably like, like I, I think I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it's probably the most important commandment when you think that you need it to uh, be able to do the rest of the commandments. But then when you think of all this actually going on here on the Sabbath day, um, it's extremely important. This this is an extremely um, commandment to 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 be paying attention to here. A um, lot of lot of blessings here that is being talking about. You're probably going to end up having to watch this video again, you know, with your pencils out, you know, and go in and study these verses because it's a lot of information related to the Sabbath day here. Um, we're, let's look over here at Exodus chapter 23 and verse 12. Um, it's talking about the Sabbath day. But like I've been mentioning several times, some of you guys, you know, you've probably heard me say this phrase a hundred times. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 through 23 or Exodus chapter 20 through 24 verse 7 is actually the uh, book of the covenant. The reason why I say the verse 7 part is because you see in 24 verse 7 it says, And they took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. This is the book of the covenant. But it really stops in 23. But what I wanted to show you over here is in 23, you're actually talking about 
the statutes. This is actually the statutes. You see there, verse 14 is talking about three times in a year thou shalt keep the feast unto the Lord. So this is actually a statute here. You have the statutes that are talked about in 23. Let me back up and show you, you have the uh, judgments. You see there in verse 1 of chapter 21, you have the judgments in uh, chapter 21, and you have the commandments in chapter 20. So in chapter 20 and verse 8, you see the Sabbath day being given as a commandment. And then when you come over to 23 and verse 12, you see the Sabbath day being given as a statute. Now, I found that really interesting that the Sabbath day is both a commandment and a statute at this very second. So you can put it down in the comment section if you know something that I'm missing. But this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is the only rule in the Bible that's both a commandment and a statute. It's both. Both a command and a statute. And you say, well, what's the significance of that? Well, let me jump you over here to the book of Malachi and show you something right quick. You see right there in verse four of the book of Malachi. Now, this is the last chapter in the last book, even the last three verses of the Old Testament. And you see what it's talking about there is it's rounding off the Old Testament. It says, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel with the the statutes and the judgments so it's talking about the covenant the you can you see that when it's saying what he gave him at Horeb you can you can read that story um um how the commandments were or the covenant was given in Mount Horeb over there in Exodus starting about chapter 19 is where you get into all of that where he made him um get prepared for the coming day of the Lord. And that, that was the time when the Lord's voice was actually heard by all of the people. Um, it's probably the only time in scripture where everybody heard the father's voice. You know, it wasn't just one prophet or one priest or somebody, this, he, every, all 2 million of those people heard his voice loud, like trumpets uh, blowing and scared them. That was the covenant that we've been talking about. Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 24, verse seven. But you see right here, he's saying, keep that law, keep that covenant, keep those commandments, those statutes and those judgments. And then you look what happens there in verse five. He says, behold, I send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is our father's escape plan. This is how he plans on protecting us through the tribulation is by sending us angelic help. This uh this Elijah figure here, you read about him all throughout the scripture. You jump back over in uh, chapter three of the book of Malachi. He's called the covenant angel. Um, when you read it, when you jump back over in the book of Daniel, he's called uh, Michael. When you jump over in the book of Revelations, he's called it. He's called the angel of the covenant. This is an angelic figure that is coming in the end times in order to help steer us or guide us through the tribulation. You know, there's a lot going on in this apocalypse, you know, and you're not going to be able to survive without angelic help. I mean, we're talking about nuclear explosions. We're talking about global earthquakes we're talking about meteor showers um you're just not going to know where to run you're not going to know which direction in order to hide from one thing you probably ain't never heard about you know nobody talked about before is what's going to happen to these nuclear power plants all over the world you know you're basically talking about a fukushima type event occurring in just about every nuclear power plant in America. You know, when we have these earthquakes and stuff and these meltdowns and stuff. So which direction are you going to run to hide from that plume from those, you know, when that fuel is dislocated or whatever? Um, uh, I used to work in the nuclear power industry. I think about that all the time. But, you know, you're going to have to have some type of angelic help in order to steer you through that, to tell you which direction to go. Well, you can see here that it is necessary for us to keep the commandments, the statutes and the judgments of the book of the covenant if we want that angelic help. And like we said, the, the 
the commandment or the rule uh, t of the Sabbath day is both a commandment and a statute. You know, so I think that lends to the importance of of that time. All right. I could go on in this class and talk about, you know, some other stuff, but I believe we've covered, you know, enough to give you guys the idea about this Sabbath day. Um, you can um, jump over and read about the rules. Some of you are going to be wondering about the rules. You can see them all throughout your Bible. Remember that it's in Jubilee chapter 50 as well. That's probably the most detailed, um, uh, most comprehensive place you can see about the, all of the rules associated with the Sabbath day. Um, you can see classes we've done on how to calculate the sabbath day going forward but just make sure that you keep a sabbath day and remember that this eighth day this eighth day of this feast coming up is a sabbath day so a lot of you guys want to be paying attention to that so i hope you guys will you know make that day a delight uh make that day a joyful occasion and then start to and and make it a part of your life then start to keep the sabbath day for for now on you know until the planet goes up in the smoke or whatever um make the sabbath day a part of your life i hope you got that out of this video and for those guys of the gentile church who, you know, watch our videos, you know, to kind of get some information on when the rapture will take place. Um, I know, you know, they're kind of choking on the idea that the Sabbath day could have something to do with their salvation. I am saying that pretty plainly. Um, I believe the scripture is saying it too, that the Sabbath day is necessary for the salvation. But y you have to understand that, you know, there's two different kinds of salvation. One, um, when it comes to the Gentile religion, the word salvation is really only talking about, you know, them going to heaven after they die. When they die, they'll go to heaven. All they have to do is believe in Christ and, you know, they'll die and they'll go to heaven. That's um that's according to their doctrine. That's what they believe. Um, that's part of their religion or whatever. But that's not really what we're talking about here. You know, over here at Hermes Academy, we're actually talking about inheriting the earth. Like you read about in Matthew chapter five and verse five. Um, there is a group of people, a small group of people who are going to obey the Sabbath day. They're going to obey the statutes, the commandments and the judgments. And they're actually going to live through the tribulation, um, the same way Noah lived through the flood and they're going to go on to inherit the earth. They're going to go on to repopulate the earth. And that that's the kind of saved that we're talking about. There's two different kinds of saved. And when we say that uh, salvation, that the Sabbath day is necessary for the salvation, you guys cut us some slack. You know, we're not planning on flying away. You know, we're not planning on, you know, going, you know, to the spirit world at all. You know, especially here before this tribulation, you know, we, we may get there one day. But, you know, as of now, our focus is on surviving the tribulation, living through the tribulation, living through this apocalypse and that's what we call saved when we say we want to be saved that's what we mean um and to do so we understand that we have to obey the statutes we have to obey the commandments we have to do what the bible says we can't just believe real hard and say jesus enough times um to get that salvation but anyway I uh, hope you got something out of this video. If you did, hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. And shalom.